Quick turnaround on the snack and back in the sanctuary. I just wanted to um, go over a few announcements. If we can get the second row to be quiet here. Nathan, you're just out of control, brother. <laughs> It's always the last guy who gets caught pushing, right? The other guy started it, but, you know, it's whatever. They, you get the flag, and it's, yeah. Anyway, welcome. It's good to see you. If I don't know you, I would like to know you. My name is Pastor Scott, uh, senior pastor here. My son Andy and his wife are doing hospitality. He is uh, an associate pastor, and Pastor Eric, who led worship, we're your leadership, and uh, it's our privilege uh, we take our role very seriously. So, I want to go over a couple of announcements. First, prayer. We have an uh, online prayer meeting every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. We pray for an hour. Uh, so it's, you can jump on for any or all of that time. You can access it through Zoom. You can access it through our website, calvarychapelithica.org. Also, we have Life Group, and that is a weekly meeting at our home, small group meeting. Um, Joni will be heading that up this week. I'll be out of town, but that's at 6.30. All are welcome. And then thirdly, we are just want to make you aware that we'll have a baptism and a picnic on May 5th. So if uh, you are interested in Christianity or you're new to Christianity, then baptism's a worthy subject to consider. I uh, would love to talk to you, or you could talk to Pastor Eric or my son Andy, and uh, just find out about baptism. What we do is we just have a little kiddie pool. <laughs> we put right up here in the front of the building, uh, in the front of the sanctuary, uh, enough water to make sure you're wet. And uh, yeah, we baptize and then enjoy some fun afterwards with a, a picnic. It's also, I think, maybe the next to the last day of classes, so it seemed like the opportune time before the semester ends. Uh, One last thing, and that is to remind you, baby bottles for the pregnancy center. Uh, Many of those left the building, just to remind you, these are, it's a way that the Finger Lakes Pregnancy Care Center raises money to operate. So uh, our current uh, Well, their center is down on Green Street, I think. Um, So they don't get any federal funding, nothing through the Red Cross. It's dependent on the generosity of the body of Christ, typically. So take a baby bottle, put your loose change or soft money in there or a check. They don't have an online giving platform. So this is one of their main ways. I just grabbed a bottle that was somebody left behind. You can bring them back here. I'll get them down there. Or you can take them down there yourself. So baby bottles as a reminder. Okay, please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 23. We're studying the book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We are now in chapter 23. Genesis 23. says, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So we have, for the last number of months now, we've been essentially studying Abraham's life. His wife is Sarah, and uh, Sarah has died. Tells us she's 127. Yes, she was 127. That's a long time to live. People lived longer back in those days. We know from our study through Genesis, beginning mostly in chapter 12 to this point, that Abraham was 10 years older, So he's 137. Sarah gave birth to Isaac when she was 90. So that makes Isaac 37. Uh, She lived a long time. It's interesting, Sarah is the only woman in the Bible, the only woman in the Bible 
that we have a record of the years of her life and her death and burial. Quite interesting. She is held up to us as uh, mainly to the ladies, uh, as a role model of a woman of faith. Uh, so Sarah. It says Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes about uh, grief, the goodness of grief. Whether it be the loss of a mom or a dad or a sibling or the loss of a friend or the loss of a pet, <laughs> for heaven's sakes. We have loss. There's so much loss in this world, isn't there? can be loss of a job, loss of health. I personally would appreciate a little loss of appetite. I'm getting fatter. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little self-discipline would be good. Uh, a lot of loss, a lot of suffering, loss of reputation, loss of trust. It's the world we live in, friends. Loss of friendship, a parent, a spouse, as I said. It's good to weep. Famously, Jesus wept. I believe it's John 19, verse 33. Shortest verse in the Bible. Right? No excuse for not being able to memorize a verse of Scripture. <laughs> Two words, Jesus wept. You can check me on that. It's somewhere, it's John 11, sorry, not 19, John 11. I believe it's 30, 33, something, whatever. It's interesting because he wept at the loss of his friend Lazarus. He wept at the fact that his dear friends, Mary and Martha, Lazarus' surviving sisters, were just so grief-stricken. And uh, Jesus, knowing that he was going to call Lazarus back into his dead body and bring him out of that cave, he still was he was able to sympathize with our situation in life. He understands. That's, that's the beauty of that experience we see in Jesus, in that he stepped into the space that Mary and Martha were in, and it was a hard place, especially because they knew Jesus loved their brother. It tells us that in John 11. And they had asked him, they prayed. Essentially, they prayed, and they didn't get an answer. We know what that's like. There was a long delay, and the Lord finally came, and it was too late. And of course, he supernaturally and gloriously shows himself to be God by calling that life back into the body and bringing him out of the... But before any of that, he, he sympathized with the, the grief that we experience in life, the loss that we have. So it says that Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for Sarah, not because Sarah was in a bad place. It's because he'd lost his best friend. Genesis 2.24, a man will leave his father and mother. He will be joined to his wife and the two will become one. They've been married for over 62 years. He entered the promised land at 75. She was 65. She died at 127. They were married before they left Iraq when God called them. It's possible they've been married for a hundred years. Talk about becoming one. And by the way, friends, it's a process. You don't just become one on your honeymoon. Yes, there's a physical union, but the process of two lives actually weaving their souls together is, takes a, it takes a lifetime of Argument and failure and repentance and forgiveness and all the stuff that happens in human relationship intensified in a marriage relationship. Abraham's grieving because he lost his friend, his closest partner in crime, the one who traveled with him, put up with him, loved him in spite of the many faux pas that he had done. 
So it's okay to grieve, all right? Grief is good and it's necessary for all of us. Paul famously told the church in Thessalonica, right? He said, don't, don't grieve like people who have no hope, right? Because there is that beautiful thing in Christianity that we know there's life beyond this world. And Paul's like, you, you don't need to feel like all hope is lost. No, they've actually gone to a truly better place because they're in the presence of Jesus. But Paul, who actually who wrote that himself in Philippians, wrote about a dear friend of his named Epaphroditus, who was sick, almost died because of his illness. And Paul said, I'm so thankful God spared him, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He would have greatly missed the, the friendship and the interconnection and the, and the support and the grace that comes from our personal relationships. So grief is good. It's proper to mourn loss. James Montgomery Boyce said, to weep for a loved one is to show that we have been close, that the loss is keenly felt, that death is an enemy, and that sin has brought this sad punishment upon the human race. And so there is a perspective that we have when, when death comes. And uh, don't put a time frame on somebody. There's an interesting little verse in Genesis 24. You can flip over there, the very last verse. The very last sentence of the very last verse. Genesis 24, 67. It says, Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Okay, okay, well, it's a big deal. Well, as I told you, Isaac was 37 when his mama died. Isaac got married at 40. He grieved for three years. Don't put a time frame on somebody. It, I, I have no idea how long it's going to take for you and the Lord to process. So some people stuff things down. We don't want to deal with this. There's denial, right? Uh, that's why it's good to attend services where the loved ones are remembered and to start the process yourself. There's another kind of loss since I have a room full of young people. I think it seems appropriate to say also that there is another kind of loss that can be good to grieve over and that would be the loss of innocence Okay, a loss of faithfulness to God, to your family. Um, yeah, <laughs> just guard your hearts, young people, and your relationships. <laughs> All right. Uh, I know you have lots of conversations. You know, you determine the relationship and what your boundaries are. And uh, those might be different for different people. Uh, so just be careful, uh, ladies, where he's touching you. And uh, I don't necessarily mean what part of your body. I'm talking about, is there anybody else around? Are you in a private place? <laughs> All right. Uh, because uh, things will spin out of control very quickly. Uh, it's good to grieve over the loss of innocence. It's good to grieve over that. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and he said, Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. So, a, a failure in this area of your sexual purity is not unforgivable. Just humble yourself before the Lord and confess with all your honesty. Receive his amazing grace and then tell others. 
Tell someone else. Don't go through it alone. Live your life in the light with other people. I've probably told you this story before, forgive me if I have, but uh, I had a pretty sketchy past personally before the Lord came into my life. And I brought a lot of muscle memory, a lot of baggage with me into the relationship with my wife, Joni. And um, well, anyway, (laughs) there was a little misunderstanding one day between myself and a young lady at church, actually. And uh, she was a cute little thing. And she obviously misunderstood something that I had said and done and thought that I was making an advance toward her. And she was responding in kind. So I never said anything, but I was thinking about it. Finally, I called my pastor, Pastor Jeff. I said, can I come in and talk to you? And he said, sure. And I told him the whole story. And he said, well, you got to go home and tell Joni. I said, I can't tell Joni. <laughs> That's, that would, ah. And he just leaned back and he smiled. He said, the devil loves it if you keep things in the dark. You got to get it into the light, brother and sister. I'm not saying come up here and confess to me. I'm saying go to the Lord. He's the only one that can cleanse you of your sin. But if there's been an offense with another one, then talk to them as well. It's good to grieve over that. There's an interesting verse in the Song of Solomon that says, Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. (laughs) I'm not sure I understand that verse all the way, but I would say to you, young women of Calvary Chapel, or older women, or men of Calvary Chapel, don't stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. Amen? Loss is a time of reflection. To, it is a powerful time of reflection. When, when there's been a loss, and I'm speaking a bit, I'm speaking actually quite specifically now of the, the, the separation that can happen either through death or, well, the horrible thing that we go through every May or sometimes December with all of you lovely people, right? You come here, We fall in love with you, and then you graduate, and you kiss us goodbye and go off, and we never see you again. It hurts. It hurts everybody. You feel it. We feel it, right? So, but there's always with that, amen, there's a time of of introspection. It's a time to go back and to say, God, do I have any regrets? Is there something... I wish I had been more generous. I'll honest, that is almost always the reflection that I come up with. It's like, man, I wish I had given more. There was times where you'd, you know, you'd go back in your mind and remember, oh, a little too busy, a little slow on the response with the email or text and things went past, you missed the meeting. It's like, ah, oh, it's so stupid. So loss is a good time to reflect. There's a interesting verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. What a great verse. Been traveling recently for a commitment that I have which takes me through the hometown where my mom and dad are buried. Every so often, because it's not too far out of the way, I'll just go over and stand. And it's been two years. No goodness, it's been, it'll be almost four years now. My mom, four years for my mom. Wow, time flies. It was just a few weeks ago, to be honest, I was standing there and it it surprised me because I thought I was done grieving. And not at all, there was more. It's just like, wow, the tears came. I miss them so much. It's good to grieve. 
with a lot of loss in life. The Lord's sympathetic. He understands the things that are going on in your heart and mind. He's just that good and powerful. Where did Sarah go? Like I know, she's, Abraham's got a body to deal with now. But where did Sarah go? You've all been to calling hours, maybe, maybe not. But you look inside that wooden box and you see an empty shell. That friend or loved one, they're not home. <laughs> they're somewhere else. That's just a, a lifeless body with a whole bunch of formaldehyde or something in it. It doesn't even look right, right? Where did she go? Well, that's a great subject. And I thought, well, the text brings it to our forefront in these two verses. So we'll take just a moment to talk about that. In the Old Testament, it is called a place called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. In the New Testament, uh, the word is Hades. Uh, they're synonymous, different words because they were written in different languages originally. But they both mean the same thing. It's a place of the departed. It literally means the grave. All right? Um, so that's where her body went. And it awaits a resurrection. All right? But Sarah herself, now where did she go? The Bible does give us some understanding about the afterlife. And, well... In fact, um, was it Matthew 22? There were some rationalists, right? Which we have a community full of rationalists, right? Give me scientific evidence, and then I'll believe. Well, the Sadducees were sad, you see. <laughs> you had to say it, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, they were rationalists, right? And because of that, they're, they, they're like, there's no way there's a resurrection. And so they challenged Jesus, laid out this little thing, right? Man had a wife. She died before he could have kids, or he died before she could have kids. The whole thing, seven wives, seven husbands, whatever. And he gets to the end, and they're like, see? So there, there's no resurrection. And the Lord's like, you do err because you don't understand the scripture. He said, what did Moses what did God say to Moses at the burning bush? God said to him, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of the living. Sarah's alive. Sarah of the Old Testament her soul and spirit is living now, today. Where? I don't know. Possibly in heaven. It's not quite as clear about Old Testament saints. But I do know that Jesus told the famous story of a rich man and a poor man, and they both died. And in that story, the Lord said, the sinner who never repented went to a very hot and tormenting place and the other one went to Abraham's bosom, actually, a very comforting and, and loving and joyous and beautiful, peaceful place. And the two of those could never connect. It's Luke 16. Sometimes we, we think from that story, that's Jesus telling the story about the afterlife. And we think that from that story that Old Testament saints, saints went to this place of the departed souls. And that uh, possibly after Jesus rose from the dead, he gathered those up and took them to heaven with him. But this much I do know from what my New Testament tells me. And that if you are, if you died with Christ, then you are united with him in his resurrection and we are seated with him in the heavenlies so that when I die, my body, whatever happens to my body, I got to figure that out actually, getting in that time of life. It's like, what am I gonna, what, what's going to happen? Um, 
but I know where I go because I'm bought with a price. He purchased me with his own blood and I go to be with him. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross who believed? He said, today, you'll be with me where? Paradise. (laughs) Paul famously said, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. In fact, let me read a couple of verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul again, just to make it clear to you that when you as a Christian, if you have the Holy Spirit sealing you and identifying you as, one, as a Christ follower, then you have the assurance by virtue of the Spirit bearing witness to your spirit that when you die, you go into the presence of Jesus. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, for we know that if the tent... I just wanted to read that. We know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's so interesting. Joe Fos always loves to say, this thing that you see right here, this is a, this is a tent, right? It's like a man goes out into space and he walks, gets outside of the spaceship. He's in a space suit. Right? But the man is inside the spacesuit. This is a spacesuit. I live inside this thing. And someday this spacesuit's going to fall off and I'm going to heaven. And then the Lord eventually will raise my body and he'll give me a new suit, suit that is fit for heaven. Or he might just take me while I'm alive. There's a good biblical doctrine called the rapture. But Paul, nevertheless, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse 6, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I love that. Away from the body, Home with the Lord. Home. And that what the prodigal son essentially said? He figured it out. Home is where my father is. That's home. It's not 1432 Hanshaw Road, which is my address. <laughs> That's just a temporary dwelling place. And this is just a temporary spacesuit. <laughs> Eternal in the heavens. All right, let's go back to Genesis 23. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in the land of Canaan. Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Great loss for Abe. He's now a single dad. He's got an adult son. I don't know if he saw this coming, cause of death unknown. Uh, could be just a, a, a long, well-lived life. The next handful of verses really are very interesting because now Abraham has a desire to establish a burial site for Sarah, okay? And um, it's an interesting uh, thing that he's going to do, and we'll... I guess let's just talk about that here. It says now, verse 3, Abraham rose from before his dead and said to the Hittites, (laughs) um, he said, verse 4, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So when it says sojourner or foreigner, It means that he's a resident alien, okay? It means that um, he has no, he has some footing, but he doesn't really have many rights. You see, because he came from another country, he's been living in the land now for, as I said, 60 some years, but he's still, it's all been very temporary. Abraham's life, he just 
continually lived in a tent. And that's actually very significant. Lot, his nephew, chose to live in a city. He settled down, and it didn't go well for Lot because he lived in Sodom. Abraham's like, no, I have more of a pilgrim nature because this is not my home. He understood that God had called him and that he was someday going to live in heaven forever. And so he's like, you know, I'm not going to allow myself to get really deeply settled into what this world has and what it provides. So he lived in tents his whole life. Now he decides while he's, I'm guessing while he's at the, at the side of Sarah, who remains are there, that he goes back through his mind like we do. There's that introspection and he thinks about all the wonderful times that they've had together. And there were several times where God had spoken to Abraham and had given him a covenant, the covenant of Abraham. Very powerful covenant. And that covenant had to do with people in a place. The place was the very land that he was standing on. It was Canaan, but it would eventually become known as Israel, inhabited by 12 tribes, the people of the Jews. Abraham was a chosen man, and from him came the chosen people. People, and the place was Israel. And in that covenant, God promised Abraham, well, I wrote it down here in chapter 13, all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. Genesis 15, to your offspring, I give this land. Genesis 17, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Side note, an appropriate side note. Don't be confused by the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'm not going to delve into that deeply, but let me just tell you, God promised that land to his people. That is their land. Okay? Palestine will be free. I hope not. Knowing what that means, right? God gave that land. God gave it to Abraham for an everlasting possession. They've been out of that land for years and years and years. But through the prophecies throughout the Old Testament, they are back in. Their behavior with their neighbors, not good. I grant you all that. But I'm just trying to tell you that's a covenant that made with Abraham. So Abraham, no doubt, began to think about those things. He didn't have to buy land, but he chose to buy land. He chose to establish a firm burial site for his wife, who he needs to take care of business pretty quickly, actually, in those days, and for himself, and eventually for his son Isaac and his future wife Rebecca, and on goes the story. So I suggest to you, friends, that Abraham's, he didn't, have to, he didn't have to buy the land. God promised it to them, to his people. But I think that his buying the land was sort of putting his foot in the ground, putting a stake in the ground and saying, no, I'm going to, you know, we're getting on now. Sarah's passed. I don't know how much longer I have. I think we'll just do this so that we'll establish, it will still almost be prophetic, that it will establish the witness that God has this, his hand on this place through our family, through this people. And so he rose from before his dead and he said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Just a, I'm a temporary dweller. He said, give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites entered Abraham. Hear us, my Lord. You are a a prince of God, or a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. 
fascinating. Next verse. Abraham rose and bowed. He bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. Here's the only man on the planet who has the covenant, the promise of God on his head. And he bows down to a bunch of unbelievers. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me. And entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is, it is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. So in all of Abraham's travels, he, had, he knew what he wanted. He had set his sight on this particular cave as he describes it here. He even went to the county clerk and looked up the deed and figured out who owned the thing. That's what you do, by the way. <laughs> and so he goes to this people and it says in verse 10, now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites of all who went in at the gate of his city. Pause. That's a very cool thing. As you read your Old Testament, the gate of the city is the place where transactions were officially done. The gate of the, it was, a, it was the business office, so to speak. All right? Y'all remember the story of Ruth and Boaz? Are you familiar with Ruth? How many are familiar with the book of Ruth? Good. If you're not, I strongly encourage you to read the book of Ruth, right? Ruth uh, became the great-grandma of King David. I think I got that right, great-grandma. But anyway, uh, I'm telling you that because all the, 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 the drama of the book of Ruth, it's only four chapters, it's a very easy read. It all culminates at the gate of the city. That's where the public transactions were signed, sealed, and witnessed. Okay? So Ephron, apparently Abraham knew the owner, but he didn't know him personally. So he bows himself, he's at, he's at the, all these big important people are sitting at the gate of this city, uh, and Abraham comes, he's got a pocket full of money, by the way, <laughs> and he bows down before these guys and he states, his, this is why I'm here, I want to buy some property. Right? I'm going to put a stake in the ground and, and claim a little bit of land for future purposes. And so it turns out that the owner was sitting right there. I apparently didn't know him. <laughs> kind of interesting. And Ephraim, verse 10, was sitting among the Hittites. And Ephraim answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites. And he said, verse 11, no, my Lord, hear me. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field. I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Now, wait a minute. Abraham asked for a cave. Ephraim's like, yeah, you can have the cave. You got to buy the field too, bro. <laughs> it's like, I only want the cave. Sorry, I'm not selling the cave without the field. He's, a, he's driving a hard bargain here. And by the way, three times he says, I give, I give, I give. Uh, Derek Kidner says, that is conventional fiction. <laughs> okay, it's just the, the, the way that business, was. everybody knew there was going to have to be a purchase. It was going to cost Abraham something. Good discipleship costs you something, amen? You may have the, you have the covenant, the promises of God on your head. But to follow the Lord, there is a cost involved. And Abraham didn't claim some special privilege just because he's a, a believer. And so this man's like, well, I give. Then Abraham, verse 12, bowed down before the people of the land again. And he said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will, hear me. If you will, hear me. I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead. My goodness, there's no negotiation. He's like, I need a cave and here's the owner. And the owner's there. He goes, oh, the owner, cool. Can I buy your cave? Nope, 
got to buy the field and the cave. Abraham's like, okay. I'm not sure I would have done that. <laughs> he says, uh, that's what he said. Verse 14, Ephron answered Abraham. Now this is Ephron. He said, verse 15, my Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? <laughs> Bury your dead. Does that seem, that seems really funny to me. I mean, it just happens to throw out, uh, you know, what's 400 shekels? <laughs> you know, he's stating his price. And by the way, it's really overinflated. And Abraham, verse 16, he listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. I love that story because it tells me a couple of things, which I... I'm here to tell you about. Number one, Abraham put his money where his faith is. And I'm being challenged on that. Well, actually, I'm being very encouraged. As you know, we've got some concept design drawings for a, a bigger sanctuary, right? Well, it's a million bucks, right? We have $65,000 in the bank, period. It's like, okay, we need a miracle. Lo and behold, some brother comes over and drops a thousand dollars cash in our hand. It's like, you gonna believe Scott? He put his money where his faith is. He believes, I believe, God is calling us to do it. How much am I willing to invest? I think I'll say that's enough for that right now. <laughs> So cool, isn't it? You know, Jeremiah 32, there's actually a beautiful story in Jeremiah's life that, is, that examples this idea of putting your money where your faith is, okay? Jeremiah chapter 32, I'll give you the scene. He's in prison. They, the king put the prophet in prison because he didn't, he wanted to shut him up. And while Jeremiah is in prison, God comes to him and says, your nephew, your cousin's going to come to you and, and, and ask you to buy a piece of property from your hometown. And I want you to buy it. Well, the problem is the Babylonians have surrounded Jerusalem. The fall of Jerusalem is just days away. And Jeremiah has been prophesying this. We're not going to survive this. We're going to be taken captive. We're going to be hauled off into Babylon. This is the end of Israel in the promised land. And God says, buy a piece of land. Jeremiah's like, okay. <laughs> he put his money where his faith is. Sure enough, his cousin comes along and he says, uh, I bought the field 17 shekels of silver. 17. Very different from Abraham. I signed the deed, sealed it, got a witness, and weighed the money on the scales. In the presence of the witnesses, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought, brought into this land. He was doing it because he knew that God had promised to bring his promised people back into the land. And so he did the deal. Gave it to his buddy, said put it in a clay pot. And when all those, this is going to happen long after my life. They'll come back, maybe somebody will find that clay pot, open it up, and there's the thing. God keeps his word. He promises to get you from here to there. There's a great line in the, in, the, in the Gospels, right? Get in the boat, boys. Let's go to the other side. Let's go to the other side. On their way to the other side, they hit a storm, they about drown. Lord, don't you care? We're perishing. Didn't I tell you I could get you from here to there? I can get you from here to there. He can do it. He's done it. So 
So that's my first point. Put your money where your faith is. It's a good challenge for all of us. The second point I just want to make is that Abraham's business dealings, I think it's a great example of, uh, and I'll just transfer this into current vernacular. He's a, he's a good example of a Christian in the marketplace. He's a good example of a brother or sister who's in business in interacting with people who are not Christian. And, and he's, look at the respect that he shows to those who are outside of the faith. He bowed down to them. I'm not saying go bow down to somebody, but I'm saying respect them. They, they are image bearers by virtue of being human. They, they are deserving of our respect. Secondly, he was very generous. He knew that it was overinflated. He never even questioned it. 400, out comes the bag, bunch of silver, 400. Thirdly, he was honest. And fourthly, it was official, it was public. There were witnesses. It was none of this, let me pay you under the table, brother, so we can avoid the tax situation. Don't do that. Or maybe you sell a car, right? And you're asking five, and the buyer's like, well, just put three on the deed. Then you won't have to pay as much, and I'll give you two grand in cash. Nope. Done that many times. Sorry, bro, I don't do that. That's not how I roll. It's going to cost you. Yeah, it's going to cost me. But I'm going to go to bed with a clear conscience. He was respectful, he was fair, he was honest. And he did things that were, just had integrity. That's the way we should be in this world. Amen? Just behaving ourselves with integrity. It is a black eye to Christianity when a man or woman who's known in the business or political community as a faithful, known as a faithful believer, a Christian, but has a bad reputation. Somebody who you just don't want to deal with that brother or sister. That is, that aggravates. Look, I know I'm capable of the same thing. I have a sinful nature that wants to beat the system and the whole thing, but you, you, you control yourself. You don't want to be known as somebody who's untrustworthy or does shoddy work and doesn't take responsibility for what you've done. When all was said and done, Abraham went back. He had bought the cave and everybody in the surrounding community said, wow, that's definitely Abraham's because he spent a lot of money for that thing. And he said, it's right. And so it's mine. <laughs> and I think there was just a, a growing respect that came out of that. Sometimes it's better to spend more than less. Well, we're about out of time. I just wanted to close by saying that um, I wanted to close by pinging off of Abraham saying, I am a sojourner and a foreigner. He was a person who lived temporarily in, uh, in that land. But Abraham also knew that he had a home in heaven. And Hebrews 11 makes that very clear. So I just want to say to you, friends, the ultimate sojourner was Jesus Christ. Amen. John 1, 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt means he lived in a tent, a human body. That's why I wanted to make that point to you earlier. It was just a temporary stay. Jesus didn't, he didn't come to buy land. He didn't come to buy a cave. In fact, as near as I can tell from reading through the Gospels, I can't find a place where Jesus ever spent any money. 
to buy anything. There was a time when we were like, he was asked, right? Should we pay tax to Caesar or not? He's like, gosh, you caught me. I, I, <laughs> I don't have any money. Anybody got any money? <laughs> he was poor. He came to buy souls. You're not bought with silver and gold. You're bought with the precious blood of a lamb. Peter 18, 118. It seems that the Lord just, he's the ultimate sojourner. He borrowed a womb. He borrowed a tomb. And everything in between. And then he gave his life to wash you clean from sin and guilt and shame and to set us free. To set us free from the power and the penalty and the pleasure of sin. And he rose again to give us assurance of eternal life in heaven. My brothers and sisters, Christianity is a resurrection. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ applied to your situation. What did the prodigal's father say about the son when he finally came home? He said, my son was dead, now he's alive. You are born with a sinful nature that has made you spiritually separated from God. God loves you so much, he gave his only son so that he could fix that. And, he, and the son gave his life. He took the penalty we deserved to set us free. Proved it by the resurrection. Christianity is a resurrection. It's taking someone who's dead and making them alive. The prodigal said, my son was lost. Now he's found. And it happened through repentance and faith. He looked inside and said, I stink. And at the same time, he looked at his father and said, he's amazing. I'm going home. And home is where my father is. Today is the day of salvation. For anyone who will believe, you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through repentance and confession and belief in his death and resurrection, you will be saved. Gospel truth. Let me close with the lyrics from a song by Mary Barrett. Doubtful that any of you have ever heard of Mary Barrett. She was a worship leader at a Calvary Chapel in Merritt Island, California, uh, Florida, for many years. Uh, she's in heaven today. Look it up, friends. Mary Barrett, All My Tears. Check it out. You will love it. Get a bunch of people together. You'll be dancing. Okay, I guarantee it. Mary Barrett, All My Tears. This is what she says or sings. When I'd cry, or sorry, when I die, don't cry for me. I know it's everything I just said not to do, Pastor Kat. <laughs> <laughs> when I die, don't cry for me. I'll be home and I'll be free. The wounds this world left on my soul will all be healed and I'll be whole. Sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face and I will not be ashamed for my Savior knows my name. It don't matter where you bury me. I'll be home and I'll be free. It don't matter where I lay. All my tears are washed away. Paul said, I've suffered the loss of all things that I may gain Christ. And he meant it when he said it. I suffered loss, but I gained Christ. Zero plus Jesus is everything. Amen. Stand and pray with me. Lord, it's amazing that you can wiggle your way into the text out of this interesting account of a death and a burial. And we can find 
great truth from you, Lord. I thank you that you are sympathetic to all the situations in everyone's life in this room. And you're powerful and you're alive. And I pray you will just continue to be glorified in the way that we live. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you next week.